are talking about the mystery of Edwin Drew. And as uh, most of you know that I, I wouldn't normally be in makeup uh, before uh, a show, or certainly wouldn't let an audience see me uh, in makeup before a show. Um, the lead is over there judging me silently as an actor. Um, not silently. But um, it's not. <laughs> say what? Not silently. Not silently, yeah. That's why he's on the front. Um, but uh, there is more, so you'll be a little more surprised, I hope, uh, when it's all said and done. But the title of tonight's lecture is As Vulgar and Uncivilized as, Ill as Is Legally Possible, um, which is actually a reference to one of the lines of the show, and I'll explain why it's there in just a few moments. The Mystery of Edwin Drood uh, was the final novel written by a uh, famous Ed uh, excuse me, Victorian uh, novelist, uh, Charles Dickens. I, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talk, talking about Charles Dickens or his writing style, primarily because you're going to learn from Tim in just a little bit. We will have a Bravo reception next year where we do end up talking about Dickens, and that's all I'm going to tell you. It's a little spoiler. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail uh, about Dickens, partially because that I'm, I know I'm going to I, I'm going to get to talk about it next semester or season, but also because this uh, play and this novel does not really follow along the lines of a typical Dickensian story. It is uh, the only mystery novel that he attempted to write. Um, it uh, was an homage toward the end of his life to a dear friend of his who was a famous mystery novelist. Um, and so it, it doesn't really follow the typical uh, Dickensian story that we're used to. Although most Dickens, uh, I keep wanting to say Dickens shows, Dickens novels do have a bit of a twist in them, uh, this one's a little bit more twisted than normal. Uh, he was a famous journalist, social critic, as well as being a novelist. He was also very well known for going on a circuit and speaking in theaters and reading his own work. Uh, he was known for uh, throwing himself into the characterizations and being quite dramatic when on stage reading his own work, uh, most notably when he was reading about Nancy and Bill Sykes in Oliver Twist. Uh, and toward the end of his life, he started to fall into bad health, and he wasn't able to uh, continue this. He started working on Mystery of Edwin Drew in October of 1869. And he was still traveling, he was still uh, doing these performances, and, and just to explain how many of these performances he was doing, not only was he traveling across England and throughout Europe, but he also took, made two large tours to the US where he presented readings of his works in New York and along the Eastern Coast. Um, and if, if you've never read any of his writings on his opinions of his visits to the US, they are enjoyable. Um, but he wrote The Mystery of Edwin Drood um, as a serial, which was not uncommon for him. He actually made um, the publishing in a serial format uh, come into fashion during the Victorian period, which means that he would write a couple chapters and they would print them either every month or every week. Typically, he uh, released his pieces within 20 publishings. Uh, with The Mystery of Edwin Drood, he decided he was going to release it in 12 publishings. He started writing it in October 1869. He didn't publish the first one until April 1970. The, uh, in March of, I'm sorry, 1870, thank you. In Mar <laughs> Quite amazing, he lived so much longer than I'm sure he did. Um, in March of 1870, his doctors told him that his health was too poor and that it needed to come off of the circuit and to stop performing, uh, which was a great loss for him. He, he was going, he regretted it greatly that he stop doing that. But by the time he got uh, to writing The Mystery of Edmund Drew, he was already four months ahead. Uh, when he finally published in April 19, 1870, he, um, uh, they released several chapters at a time. And uh, then in March, he, uh, before that, he had come off the circuit. Uh, and then in June, he was busily writing, uh, on June 8th, he spent the entire day busily writing chapter 22 which was part of the sixth publication, and he was already three months ahead of time for that. At the end of that day, he sat down to dinner with his family, and he had a stroke. Uh, reportedly, his last words were on the ground uh, in a response to his sister, who had asked him to please lay down uh, because they recognized that something was wrong. He died early the next morning on uh, June 9th. 
which meant that they continued publishing the, the um, serial sections of, of Mystery of Edwin Drood, but because he'd only uh, written as much as six of the 12, he basically gave us half of the story, and then they kept publishing it after he died, and then they had nothing else. Now, I, the story tonight is going to be that we don't really know what he intended to be the end. That's not completely true. He actually wrote um, a, a synopsis to his editor, which does point toward one particular member of the cast, who I will not tell you so as to not sway your voting this evening, uh, uh, and as well as his illustrator, and I, I should point out his illustrator, a uh, well-known uh, man named Luke Fildes. This is one of the illustrations from the, um, the first publication. And I should point out that this is John Jasper and Rosa Bud. That will mean something to you if you've already seen the show, and it'll mean something if you remember it tonight while you're watching the show. But um, reportedly, Fildes says that he knew that a certain character was supposed to be the killer because Charles Dickens had corrected him on the type of tie he was wearing in the, in the uh, illustration because it was going to be the way he ended up killing Edwin Drew. And so we do know that there's two sources that lead us to believe that one direction is the way it was going. I will tell you that if that is the direction he was going, then it was good this was his only mystery novel because it's not really a mystery. <laughs> because it's kind of the obvious character. And that will mean something to you when you see the show tonight. So moving on, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, like I said, I'll talk more about Dickens next season. Um, but Dickens is writing in the Victorian period. Of course, the Victorian period later, uh, we, we name after the death of Queen Victoria, but pretty much is what we describe as during her life, 1832 to 1901. During that same period, which by the way, we think of as, as being about a move away from the rationalism that had been uh, a part of her father's reign, the Georgian era, um, and moving more toward a romanticism, a mysticism, and uh, a, a, a search in uh, connecting that to religion and social values and art. We think of the Victorian period often as having a high moral code with a whole lot going on behind the scenes that no one was talking about. There's a great deal of interest in sexuality, in uh, uh, hallucinogenics, um, and uh, experiencing uh, mysticism and, and stepping outside of religion during the Victorian period that was not a part of the moral code, but will certainly be a part of our show tonight. Um, during this time period, we uh, see the beginning of what we call the English Music Hall. When you think English Music Hall, it's probably best to think the equivalent of American vaudeville. It is a variety type show. It originated in saloons. Uh, it involved uh, the audience getting to drink and eat and uh, heckle and be a part of the, of the performance itself, something you will all get to do tonight. Um, and, uh, it, but it, one thing I would like to point out is that it starts long before the vaudeville period does. Uh, if you'll notice that the English Music Hall begins in 1850 and carries on through 1960. That's over 110 years. That's a long time for the variety art form to last, especially when we consider that American vaudeville primarily came into power in 1880 and goes out of style during the 1930s and is completely gone in America by the time we get to World War II. The equivalent is that America, English Music Hall is the same as American vaudeville, but the term vaudeville, when it's used in England, is actually much more online of what we would call burlesque. And of course, you've noticed that we're just kind of stepping down the ladder of socially acceptable art. We have Grand Opera way up here. Right below that, we have Gilbert and Sullivan, who are writing during this time period. And then we have the English Music Hall, where you can drink, and you can talk, and you can eat, and uh, get engaged. And if you get bored, don't worry. There's going to be something else in about four minutes. And then you get to their idea of what Bondo was, and that's burlesque to us. So it keeps stepping down. Now, when uh, Dickens, uh, was alive, he spent a great deal of time writing in editorials and uh, social criticism. And one of the famous places he, he wrote was the All the Year Round, which was a weekly journal, and he basically just commented on everything all the time. He was quite opinionated. This was his opinion about Music Hall. 
He said, I am naturally led from this subject to the charge of indecency and coarseness, so often made against music hall songs and singers. This accusation is brought most frequently, I fancy, by those who have the least experience of the entertainment provided at these saloons. And as it is only very partially true, palpably weakens all the arguments, however sound, which may on other grounds be advanced against them. There are double entendres, sometimes, and sometimes allusions which are gross. I love that. <laughs> but I am sufficiently the defender of music halls to declare that these are exceptional and yearly become so more decidedly. Nevertheless, the imputation of coarseness is partially true, and there is no disputing this fact. Part of what went into this coarse form of art is what we would see in vaudeville. We'd see songs, we'd see comedic acts, we'd see specialty acts. And of course, specialty acts could include a great number of things. It could be it include the guy on the flying trapeze. It could include a juggler. It could include the dog act, you know, jumping through the hoops. There are many, it could include dance. There were many different things that would fall into that specialty act. One thing that is decidedly different between English Music Hall and vaudeville in America is the use of male impersonation and female impersonation. Specifically, uh, male impersonation, in fact, if you look at English Music Hall, Male impersonation is really, that's the only place where we see it come to fruition. If you look at the history of theater, female impersonation goes all the way back to the Grecian theater. We know that it happened in the Shakespeare theater. If we look at Kabuki, at one point it was a, a mixed gender performances, and then the emperor decided that that had to go away because he knew that prostitution was happening at the theaters, so they were gonna get rid of all the females and the males would play their parts, which was all fine and good until he found out that the males then just got into prostitution. So it, 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 we really don't have anywhere else in the history of theater that we see male impersonation become a, um, an art form that is well accepted and uh, uh, is actually something that people look forward to. I said that it wasn't a part of the American Bond Bill. That's not completely true. We didn't have Americans who performed in male impersonation, but Americans loved to hire male impersonators in from England to do so. And I should say that one very well-known uh, male impersonator in the English Music Hall was actually from America originally and expatted over to England um, where she began her career there. One of the most um, important and well-known um, uh, male impersonators was a lady named Vesta Tilly. And Vesta Tilly is specifically uh, one of these characters that Jill and I, when we were designing the character of, of Edwin Drood and the personification of Alice Nutting, who plays El Edwin Drood within the show, uh, this is the person that we looked at. Vesta Tilly, she uh, began as a male impersonator at the age of six. Her father was a chairman, which consequently is the role in the show that I play, which is basically the MC and manager of the English Music Hall. Every English Music Hall had one, and it was the person who MC'd and held everything in this variety show together. Vesta Tilly, her first performance at the age, at age six, we see her here in both um, regular dress and then dressed as a man. Later on, it began where, when she was at age six and, and while she was still a child, she performed as the Great Little Tilly. Um, her, her birth name, by the way, was Matilda Alice Powers, and she legally changed it uh, to Vesta Tilly and then later took her husband's name, which I'll mention in just a moment. Her first performance was as the Pocket Sims Reeves, which was a play off of a well-known operatic tenor of that time named uh, Sim Reeves. And um, the usefulness of performing in drag, uh, uh, or what we would call a drag king nowadays, uh, is uh, as a child, she was using it to perform and to show off social commentary about children working in the workhouses. And that, so it was more of a sentimentality. It was used to, to draw the audience in and to uh, pull on their heartstrings. Later in life, 
It was much more about using that dichotomy of her being a woman playing an arrogant and usually erring man um, and performing songs like Girls Are the Ruin of Men, uh, Following in Father's Footsteps, and The Girls I've Left Behind. And at least half of the joke is that she's a woman dressed as a man singing about men. Um, she, I, I should point out though, uh, I think frequently when we think of male impersonation or female impersonation, we typically think of homosexuality. There really isn't a connection between homosexuality and male impersonation in English Music Hall. In fact, not to say that there weren't followers, frequently they would leave the, the, the star door and there'd be ladies waiting to, to take them to dinner, but they usually were not lesbians. Um, in fact, to make sure that people did not ask questions, Vesatilli always wore furs and lots of jewelry. She um, worked in, uh, she never had children herself, but she worked in children's charities. Um, she married rather young. She married uh, a man named uh, Walter de Freys, who um, later she leaves the profession of theater um, so that he can go into parliament. Uh, it was just unaccepted that she would be able to be a lady of parliament as well as a performer. Consequently, they later are knighted uh, by Queen Victoria as Lord and Lady de Freys. Um, so, an uh, interesting performance indeed. I should point out that um, male and female impersonation still carries on in English tradition today. Um, the closest equivalent that we have in uh, English theater today to the uh, music hall is what they call the pantomime, or the panto. Uh, the panto typically is performed um, these days during the Christmas season. It is expected that um, it is going to be clean enough for the entire family to come along, but it's usually going to have some thinly veiled or highly veiled um, sexual innuendos that the kids won't get, but the adults can enjoy just as much. You'll find that that is definitely a part of the mystery bedroom of Drew's night. Uh, just an example, um, there's always a female impersonator in each of these pantomime stories nowadays. In fact, just recently in 2005, Sir Ian McClellan, yes, of, of Gandalf fame, um, uh, played as uh, the widow Twonky, who is the mother of Aladdin in the pantomime Aladdin. Which leads us all to this guy. That's a great picture. <laughs> uh, this is Rupert Holmes. Rupert Holmes is the author and the composer of tonight's show. It was his first musical, uh, but not his mus uh, first musical foray. He uh, had written several Billboard uh, Top 100 chart singles uh, for people like The Jets, The Archives, Judy Collins, The Boys, Dolly Parton. She, he had done uh, all of this writing. In fact, let me take just a moment to share with you his most well-known song outside of musical theater. <coughs> Songwriter singer already in the pop field. Uh, he was performing cabaret acts in the eight, early 80s in New York City when Joe Papp of the public theater fame and his wife went to one of his performances. After the show, they spoke to him and said, You know what? You're great. You should write a show. And so he decided to write an adaptation of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, but he wanted to use the English music hall experiences and the pantomime experiences he had had while at home in England. So he took the two ideas and he crushed them together into one show. The show opened in 1985. It won two Tony Awards for him. Not bad for his first time out of the gate. He won Best Book uh, for, as the playwriter and best, uh, best New Score as the composer. Now a couple things about the writing of the show. One, of course, is based on the Charles Dickens novel, but it is very loosely based. Has anybody actually read the novel, The Mystery of Edmund Drood? I did for you. 
You don't have to. <laughs> okay? You really don't. Uh, and point blank, he says, I didn't want to directly take Dickens out of uh, the book and try and make it into a show because it would have been too bleak. I wanted to take it and make it upbeat. I wanted to make it fun. Now, he says that, but I'm going to tell you that every one of my lines in this show reads like a Dickens sentence, which means it's a big run-on sentence. Um, so, so he did include some of Dickens' style in the writing, but it's not necessarily taking lines from the show and putting them in. There are a few different changes. The character of Bazard in our play is um, the thank you is um, the assistant to Reverend Chris Barkle. In the book, he's actually uh, the assistant to a character that we don't even meet in the show. Rosa's um, uh, 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 guardian. There's the word. Rosa's guardian. And so um, that's different than what you're going to see tonight. Um, several songs he wrote later after it had its 1985 run. I should point out that not only did Joe Papp at the Public Theater encourage him to write his first musical, but the Public Theater then was responsible for the production as well. He, uh, which is, if, if you know um, anything about the Public Theater, the Public Theater is responsible for the product, first production of Air, um, it is, uh, and it's still responsible for new shows, uh, much like the current uh, running Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda's show first started at the Public Theater. Fun Home, which also just won the Tony Award, uh, just uh, started at the Public Theater. So the Public Theater and Joe Papp are well known for starting off new projects, and so it was a perfect pairing uh, when that happened. He's gone on and he's written several other pieces since then. Uh, most notably in 2003, he was nominated for a Tony Award for being just a playwright, not a composer, uh, for writing the piece Say Goodnight Gracie, based on George Burns and Grace Allen. He collaborated with uh, Kandrin Ebb, uh, uh, part of that team was uh, dead at that time, to finish Curtains, uh, which again is a murder mystery musical. Uh, that was in 2007. It got several Tony nominations, won a couple of awards. He did not win for it. Most notably, he has been cramming as many movie musicals onto the stage as he can, and he's not really finding a lot of success at the moment. Um, one of these is uh, The First Wives Club, uh, if you remember that movie, um, he, he adapted that uh, with Bloodworth, who wrote the original script. Um, uh, it didn't do so well in San Diego, it actually just had a 2015 run in Chicago, and is supposedly headed to Broadway this next season. I don't know if the critics agree with that. Um, he wrote the play A Time to Kill, based on the John Grisham novel. Uh, he also collaborated with Marvin Hamlish to write the musical version of The Nutty Professor, which opened in Nashville three years ago, right before Marvin Hamlish passed away. Uh, the first act apparently was wonderful, the second act was just horrible, and uh, now unfortunately that Marvin Hamlish has passed away, it probably will not see the light of day again. His current project is he has taken the film Secondhand Lions, that film and it just had a uh, it's uh, uh, he made a musical adaptation and it just had its opening in um, the Seattle area. That's all I have to say tonight. I gotta get downstairs. Thank you so much. Please enjoy the show.